I would now like to invite uh, uh, Sunit Singh Thuli, the CEO of DataWind. Sunit is on a ambitious project to provide essentially free mobile access to mobile computing in much of the developing world. Uh, and I, for one, don't actually know yet how he does that. So I'm interested to discover. Okay. So uh, I was thinking um, th this is a sort of very uh, ironic session. The MIT Tech Review uh, printed an interview in this current issue with me, and they called it uh, the product that we make, the anti-iPad. So you just think of the Apple Developers Conference a few blocks down the road, <laughs> and the MIT Tech Review decides to hold a mobile summit and uh, they, they've got a speaker who, who's creating a product that they call the anti-iPad. So, um, we, we believe that the uh, opportunity for the next billion, two and three billion people getting on the internet is imminent. And uh, I believe that people in Silicon Valley um, won't see it until about two billion people suddenly get on board and say, oh my God, didn't realize what just happened. And uh, from, from my perspective, uh, this is what the opportunity looks like. Uh, if you look at cell phone adoption and you curve it against internet adoption over the last 15 years or so, and while most of those were in the developed world, the differential was not more than maybe 30% for a number of years. And as it started to come out into the developing world, that gap started to increase. In my chart, I decided not to go beyond 2010 because by then, that gap was about 3 billion people. 3 billion people have access to cell phones and, uh, but not the internet. Five billion people plus have access to cell phones and only two billion have access to the internet. And that, we believe, is probably the largest opportunity that ever was. And the reason for that, in our opinion, primarily is affordability. If you think of the cost of a cell phone in a place like India, it's about a week of salary. Whereas a computer still is two months of salary. And that disparity keeps adoption of computers very, very low. Of course, the ability to deliver the internet also is a great barrier because the landline infrastructure doesn't exist. India has been putting out landline infrastructure for 100 years, and they've gone up to 30 million landline connections um, out of 1.2 billion people. Uh, they'll proudly tell you that uh, broadband penetration has increased for every quarter uh, over the last whatever period they're measuring. And now they've got 14 million broadband connections in a country of uh, 1.2 billion people, uh, while eight, 900 million people use cell phones. But those mobile networks are congested and, and are not uh, able to yet deliver an appropriate internet experience. So to understand why is affordability important we did an internal study to see when, when did PCs get broad adoption in the US. And what we discovered was that when the cost of a PC dropped below a week of salary, but 25% of salary, and we started to get broad adoption of PCs in the US. And we said, well, great, that's easy. Let's go figure out what it takes to get to that level within the Indian market. And to understand the Indian market, uh, we looked at the different economic classes, and I did a little Excel pyramid. And you, you'll notice that I, I've got four economic classes, but in Excel it looks like there's three, but there is actually a dot at the top. The, the rich Indian, uh, those that earn better than 2,500 bucks a month, uh, are that dot. But to get to those masses, uh, the, the billion people, the, the third and fourth tier of that economic class, you've got to be below 50 bucks. You've got to figure out how to deliver a reasonable 
computing internet experience below $50. I, I get a, a significant pushback from a lot of people uh, that uh, don't believe in the internet. And, and you know, for those of us that have grown up with the internet, um, when I go to college and universities and I ask students stranded on a deserted island, a cell phone or the internet, uh, it's very rare that somebody puts their hand up for the cell phone. Uh, it, you know, to me, it's without question that the usefulness of the internet surpasses anything else we've ever had access to. And the question is, do, does the poor man in that developing world understand that? And I, I'll just share with you some statistics of, of the Indian market and why computing internet access is important. Uh, there's about 220 million kids in school in India. But if you start looking at dropout rates, grades 5 to 8, 43% of the kids drop out. Grades 9 to 12, 68% of kids drop out. The number of kids that should be in school in that country is 360 million. The number of kids that are in school is 220 million. 140 million kids in that K to 12 age group are not in school. And it, it, it's for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, the Indian government puts out statistics that show you that on an average day, 3,500 schools don't have a teacher. Teachers just don't show up in some of these rural places. Um, Sugata Mitra, who does these hole in the wall experiments, and if you're not familiar with these, I, I'd really recommend on YouTube search for hole in the wall experiments and, and those sort of very compelling uh, experiments uh, that they do. Um, did this test where he took a standard math test and started giving them to kids and measured the results in direct proportion to distance from New Delhi. They just wanted to see, do teachers go out into rural areas? And what he was trying to show was that the quality of education deteriorates in direct proportion to the distance from a large metropolitan city in the developing world. Because the quality and the, of living, uh, the standard of living deteriorates very significantly. There aren't paved roads, there are no malls, you don't have proper sewage systems, uh, and, and so on and so on. And because of that, that's the issue that computing internet access will, will resolve. I, I still get a lot of pushback. Do the poor want PCs and web? Uh, the first presentation I ever made to an Indian government official was in 2003. And I used to show this picture of a rickshaw wala with a Sony Ericsson phone in his hand. Um, and I used to say, look, you know, everybody's going to have cell phones. And we've got to look at mobile learning and, and, and using those kinds of technologies to deliver education. And they tell me that you doctored that picture up. There's no way that a rickshaw wala in India is walking around with a cell phone. And, and the, the joke used to be, Sunit, uh, so who's he going to call? And then everybody certainly burst out laughing. And you know, that was when India had about 40 million cell phone users. And today, there are 900 million mobile phone connections. But we believe that education is the driver for the internet in the developing world. That that, that will be the killer app that will drive broad adoption at the bottom of the pyramid. And to, to give you a better sense of it, if I can share with you a, a quick video, if you ever go to um, YouTube and search Indian teacher funny, you'll get this, uh, it, you'll get a whole bunch of videos of camera crews that go out into villages and quiz teachers. And I'll just share with you about 40 seconds of this. Now, look apple and mango ki spelling. Ki dekh I, I, L, L, apple, 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 so, so even if you don't understand the Hindi part of it, you, you got the sense of the quality of education that gets delivered in, in some of these places. And it's not an exception to the rule. It is the rule. Uh, this is what literally millions and millions of kids get subjected to. And the internet can resolve it. And the problem with delivering the internet 
is affordability and lack of infrastructure. And we went out to try to create a $50 tablet and try to convince politicians that uh, deploying it for education could win them votes. So how do you make a $50 tablet? Uh, first is you keep trying, you go many different directions, and then suddenly Google comes in and does a few things and makes your life easier. Um, so you persevere, and, 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 the, and, and Moore's Law and many other things help you. So Google broke the Wintel monopoly. The OS, open source, it's there, you deploy it. Then they took ARM and they said, license it for a small fee and we'll port our OS onto your platform. And 50 different people started making ARM processors and the pricing of, of CPUs collapsed collapsed down to a level that, if you look at the original iPad, a Cortex-A8 one gig processor in 2010, Apple would pay $32 for. We use that caliber processor, Cortex-A8 one gig on our devices today, cost us three and a half bucks, okay? Um, and, and the margin for all of these are maybe 10 to 20%. Except for two components on these devices today, Everything else at the low end of the market, none of the suppliers make better than 20% or 25% gross margin. Gross margin, that's it. From a day where you can imagine what Intel used to make on, on CPUs. So we started squeezing supply chain margins and we have a fab in Montreal and we discovered that uh, the only two items left that have heavy margins are the touch screens and the LCD. 70 to 75% gross margins on those two components. And the only reason they have high margins is that they require heavy capital investment to be able to make. You've gotta have big fabs and other sort of complicated processes and so on. And then we thought, hey, so that's what you gotta do. You gotta figure out how to kill that margin. And we started making our own touch screens. So a touch screen that costs in a million unit quantity out of China um, about 11 bucks costs us around two and a half dollars to make in Montreal. Not because we make it any better than the Chinese. The Chinese probably make it for a buck and a half. Uh, but there's a supply demand mismatch that drives that margin up. And I truly believe that those margins will collapse in the next two years. So today we make a tablet computer. Uh, we have them outside for demos if you want to see later that we sell to the Indian government for 40 bucks. I believe that by this time next year, that level of functionality, we should be able to sell for 25 bucks. And I believe it'll continue going down because almost 60% of the cost of these, these devices today, the cost of the bill of materials, is the LCD and the touchscreen, and I believe that that's, that's gonna collapse. The other thing we had to do was we had to change the business model, and, and one of the things we did was we discovered that there's a lot more money to be made after the fact after you sold the device. We saw Apple was doing that, we saw Amazon was doing that, we saw Baidu in China was doing that. And we said, if you're going after the entry level customer, then that should be your business model. That you, you really have to focus on that more than anything else. And so hardware makes a small component of our overall margin. Uh, warranties and accessories add a little bit to it. But we negotiate relationships with network operators and we get a revenue share from the network operators and then content and subscription and advertising ends up, all, puts that all together. But the key to all of this is delivering the internet and the vision is to deliver free mobile internet. We created a parallel processing environment where we pre-process, pre-render the web page, we send that across. If you think of an average web page, about 75% of the content of that web page is today the instruction set. If you do the opposite of what WAP tried to do to the internet, where WAP thought, hey, let's go to a textual-based environment, the reality is that it's not the images that take up most of the space. Today, on a static web page, it's the instruction set more than anything else. So in that environment, if you pre-process, pre-render the web page, and then you compress, and because you're dealing with image, image-based compression tools are plentiful out there we're able to reduce the physical size of the page by factors of 10 to 30 times. So a CNN page, instead of consuming a megabyte, consumes maybe 20 to 30 kilobytes. 
on India's GPRS networks, because that's really all that's there in most of Africa and India and, and in certain other parts of the world, instead of taking five minutes to deliver a CNN page, you can still deliver it in five or seven seconds. For us here, five or seven seconds may seem very, very long. In that environment, it's actually very good. And it shifts the burden of memory and processing power to backend servers, which also helps. The data consumption gets to be so low that you can offset that by even network-based advertising in India uh, to make it free. Uh, I'll apologize, uh, I've sort of run over my time, but, but I'll, I'll continue on the rest of the story. Um, the result is we make a device that we sell to the Indian government profitably at $40.41, which has a Cortex-8 one gig processor, 512 RAM, is a seven inch standard Android device. We've proposed to them a $45 version which has a cellular modem, uh, quad band edge modem built in um, and have been pushing that uh, as, as the next level of deployment. And we, we get a lot of pushback. If you go out and read reviews of our products, you won't ever get raving reviews. You get rare raving reviews because there's a whole concept of good enough and to me, the most impactful business book ever was Clayton Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma. And focusing on good enough was very important for us. When we started off, this was a 366 megahertz device with a 256 megabytes of RAM. And if you look at the performance curve of the low end market and the, versus the high end market, certainly it, it didn't meet the requirements of the low end market and nowhere near that of the high end market. And the first version of the iPad was Cortex-8, one gig at 256 RAM. And the current version, the one we're demoing, out, demoing outside, is a Cortex-8, one gig at 512 RAM. So just you know, compared to the original iPad, same caliber of, of horsepower. They went up to a dual core, and we're not trying to compete to them. And my, my chart is misleading. It implies that the curve for the low-end device at some point will exceed that of the high-end device. It will never happen. At that 10 times price differential, uh, there will always be a gap. But the issue isn't meeting the, the performance of the high-end device. The issue is me beating the expectation of not only the low-end customer, but of the high-end customer. iPad 3 doubled the RAM compared to iPad 2. And then iPad 4 increased processing power incrementally over the previous version. In August, we will have a dual-core 1.5 gig device with a gig of RAM. Uh, with a cellular modem being offered to the Indian government at $45. It'll be good enough for most applications and certainly good enough to help kill the hardware market to make it more affordable for that next two or three billion. The question is, will they buy it? Um, uh, and I apologize if the next two or three slides uh, are a little bit of self-promotion, but uh, my life's been sort of surreal in the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, the Indian market in 2011 was 250,000 units. We were hoping we'd do 20% of that market and everybody thought we'd, we were crazy because Apple and Samsung owned that market and owned every other tablet market everywhere in the world, that 80% market share. The government announced the product, the project. We were nowhere near ready to launch commercially, maybe six months away. But we thought, you know what, we're not gonna have all the publicity by the time we were ready, so might as well put a little form on our website and let people there's this concept in India called pre-booking, where people used to pre-book their cell phones or their landline phones 15 years ahead of time. So, so we thought, you know, let them pre-book it, and you know, a few months later we'll be ready and we'll reach out to them. That made front page news for some reason. Um, didn't put out a press release, just put a little form on our website. Uh, we started getting about 100,000 a day. Our sites would crash. We started getting about 70 to 80,000 calls at our call center every day. We'd be able to answer about 4,000 of those. Um, by the time we launched, we had a backlog of 4 million units. Um, the market increased to about 3 million units in India. And in the first quarter this year, despite what we've delivered to the Indian government, we're the largest supplier of tablet computers ahead of both Samsung and, Mike, uh, and, uh, and Apple. Um, and this thing has become contagious. The Indian government has put out a sort of policy paper where they've decided in the next five years they're gonna equip 220 million kids with it. And 5% of the educational budget is gonna allow them to do it. They increase the educational budget at a rate of about 7% every year. 
and they're going to allocate 5% to this, and in the five to six years, they're going to put out to every child. We're doing projects with 13 other countries globally, where a number of other countries are doing similar kind of very large, broad deployment of low-cost tablet computers. We don't always win them. We lose them every once in a while because uh, they prefer a higher-end product or whatever else reason, but we help plant that seed. And the governments alone will end up buying enough to help get that billion on board. I didn't realize that Ban Ki-moon at the UN actually does product launches, but uh, he actually launched our product at the United Nations. And um, Forbes included us in their list of uh, Impact 15 this year, so it's been a bit of a surreal kind of life. All we do is make a cheap tablet. Thank you so much. Bring you back for a discussion with the, the audience, but just a, a couple of questions. Um, why can't Silicon Valley do this kind of frugal engineering? I mean, they say their job is to do the innovator's dilemma engineering, to produce low margin, high impact products. Hardware, I, uh, well, I, I have a lot of opinions about Silicon Valley, so. so um, well, you're here, uh, tell them. <laughs> Um, I, I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, first, uh, Silicon Valley doesn't like to fund hardware companies, right? Yeah. You know, even though hardware is a customer acquisition tool for us, uh, even though the most successful technology company in the world that makes more revenue from one device than all of Microsoft's businesses put together, okay, yeah. Apple with the iPhone, Silicon Valley does not like to fund hardware companies. Second is that I don't think that people can understand the application or the opportunity until you're in the middle of that muck, literally. And I didn't realize that until uh, about a few years ago when I saw an ad in India about um, a minivan that had a driver's seat that laid down 180 degrees. And I looked at that and I thought, how dumb is that? Driver's seat that lays down 180 degrees, why the hell would somebody need that? And then when I was in India, I discovered that most minivans are used as taxis, and the taxi drivers live in them. Right. They sleep in them, and at night, they need that seat to go down 180 degrees. So you can't understand the need or, or the environment until you're in the middle of that environment, because here, everybody has a, a smartphone, the latest, greatest, spending 29 bucks versus 49 bucks, is not going to be irrelevant. I, I, it is irrelevant. I mean, I get pressure from my customer base that the price is too high. I get pressure internally that you got to target that 25 bucks, that 50 kind of thing is not at the right level. You, you got to get to another tier and you know another segment lower. With existing technologies, how cheap could it be at scale? I, I think that um, so. When we sell at 40 bucks, our manufacturing cost is in the mid 30s. Uh, out of which um, uh, about 60% is the LCD and the touchscreen. I think that um, easily within a year, you'll see $10 erased off that uh, or more. So this is why I think 25 is possible. I think sub 20 is also possible. For most of us, sub $20. I tablet. think. Uh, look. It was unimaginable that a sub $10 phone would be possible, right? But there are lots of sub $10 phones today being sold out in, in, in the developing world. Um, and the difference between the CPUs, you know, a Cortex uh, A9 dual core 1.5 gig processor um, by August, September will be under four bucks, okay? Um, uh, you know, this level of processor, I believe, will be below two bucks. Uh, so, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's there. Um, and, and one last question to pour scorn on a friend, um, Nicholas Negroponte of the One Laptop a Child. Why did that fail, particularly in India? Why, I, why was that product over-engineered and simply unwanted? So, uh, why it failed in India was political egos, okay? Mm -hmm. Nothing else. With regards to failing anywhere else, I, I think that you know it's 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 that saying about the news of my death has been 
uh, been, been yeah. a bit exaggerated. I think that's the case. It still exists in some It still form. exists in many forms. They've put out three million devices. Over the last six or seven years, they've created a pedagogy of educational content. They've shown and they've done studies of um, self-learning environments. They've taken you know, 10 year olds in Ethiopia that have never been to a school, uh, haven't seen a word of English, and given them tablet computers. They taught themselves. Uh, and, and had started learning and absorbing and so on. Mm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think history will show them to be pioneers that did some very exciting things. And I think that their obituary is nowhere near done. So, so Nicholas uh, uh, says that if all he did was to go and show companies like DataWind, that it could be done, that it was possible, uh, and that these machines given to children could be tools of self-education. That is an enormous achievement in its own right. I, I agree. And, and to me, um, you know, OLPC and Nicholas Negroponte have been mentors mm -hmm. in the sense that, that they did a lot of that groundwork. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe the Indian government wouldn't have adopted this if they hadn't rejected him. Huh. Uh, so, so you huh. know, if those egos hadn't come into place and, and then they had a Indian looking kid from Canada, from a UK company, present to them a solution that they could potentially say, we did it. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, they <laughs> uh, so, so maybe Nicholas needed to put on a turban and go out there, but that was his, <laughs> his, his mistake. So, Thank you, sir. Yeah, we'll have you back in a you. sec. I appreciate it.